Hey, thank you very much, Ren. I've had a, um, it's been really an honor for me to be invited to come here. Can you hear me fine? This is the mic, okay. Um, we already had an exciting hour talking about some of these issues, and I, um, although I've designed a set of things to talk to you about, please feel free to pop in. That might take a bit of work since I talk very fast, but um, please just signal if you want to argue with something or want to ask a question, because um, there are some points at which it's deliberately interactive, but some points where I'm just going to plow on. Um, Essentially what I'm trying to argue this morning, and as a lot of different things I think that feed into this, is that in thinking about the question about the really, I think, embarrassing, embarrassingly poor uh, situation we face where we really only educate some fraction of our students acceptably in this country, and I'm going to use math most of the time as the context, but think about it as a context rather than that the point of my talk is about math. But given the problems that we face, I want to make a very strong argument that on one hand will probably be so familiar to you as to be boring, but on the other hand, if you go with me into it, try to think about the fact that if it were that boring, we wouldn't be in the situation we are. And the argument I want to make is that instruction that is the practice of teaching is at the heart of our effort, that has to be at the heart of our efforts to make a difference for what kids are encountering in school. Now, to say that at the NEA sounds crazy because of course this is a professional association that represents teachers in this country, but there is something a little peculiar about the fact that while we go on complaining about and criticizing American education, the solutions we choose that have to do with really improving what kids get almost never are about instruction. So try to follow my argument a bit on that and see why in fact that's so strange that I would have to even be making a case like this. So you can see my optimistic title, Improving Mathematics Learning Once and For All. But of course, there's a little bit of a double entendre there, which is I'm also worrying about the for all problem, which is not a throwaway phrase. Um, so let me get into it by just giving a little bit of context. First of all, I don't need to tell you this, but I just like to have it in front of us when we talk, which is there's really an urgent need to have the discussion we're having this morning. And I'll just frame, I think, a set of four things that explain why there's such an urgent need to be talking about this. First of all, and I'll give a little more elaboration about this, we have really shocking gaps in our kids' learning. And I'm right now not talking about or worrying about how we measure that, okay? Let's just accept the fact that Americans don't graduate from schools in this country acceptably educated for any number of things you might might care about them being ready for. The workplace, advanced study, just everyday life as a citizen in a diverse democracy. We're just not doing it well enough. And you could compare within our country what different groups get, because that's actually, I think, the heart of what I'm really worried about right now, is how hugely different the opportunities for learning and therefore the outcomes of our schools are. This is not what, um, I don't think this is what Horace Mann and his colleagues had in mind when they argued for a common school system. And here we are, you know, almost 200 years later with something that doesn't close to resemble a common school system. Um, and don't even start me on that right now because uh, it's just something I'm really, I'm really passionately worried about. But you could also compare, as many people do, how our young people do when we compare ourselves to countries we should be able to compare ourselves to. And I'm not going to go into that so much right now. So that's one thing. Another thing is that while that's all going on, we really do have a rapidly changing school population. I'll just show you a couple of snapshots of that to make as dramatic as possible, that while we're already having trouble, it's rapidly becoming more diverse, which is not going to make the challenge any easier for us. And while that's all happening, we're interestingly raising our heights on what we could really expect American kids to get in schools. I mean, the goals that we are articulating right now are really more complex academically than we've ever expected. And while we're doing that, we're expecting that for all kids. So it's not that there's never been a period where we had very high standards for academic outcomes, but we have never claimed that we were trying to do it for all kids. And now that is the rhetoric. So these four things, I think, should make anybody who's not already pretty worried, realizing that we have a serious issue on our hands. And again, I'm going to argue that without a serious attention, close attention to the practice of teaching and the people who have to do it, we're going to be having the same conversation 10 years from now. I can guarantee it. So I don't know that we need this exactly, but just to sort of remind you about why I'm worried about these gaps in quotes, one is just the shocking way in which our kids perform when you compare them in math and science to other countries. I won't go into it, but I mean, we're not even in the top half when we compare eighth graders in this country to eighth graders in other countries in math and science. 
If you look at things like NAEP, and again, I don't right now really want to take up the question of how we measure learning, because even if we had better measures, I think we'd still be having the conversation about what kids are getting. But if you just, like, this is my point about disaggregation, like, you know, you might say that's okay, that roughly three quarters of kids in this country score above basics, it's not wonderful. But the thing that's really problematic is once you disaggregate that into particular ethnic groups, and I could have gone into more detail here, for example, by disaggregating out of Asian American students, which would again change the portrait, you see something very different when you disaggregate and you notice that four out of five white kids are scoring above basic, but when you look at, for example, African American students, you have fewer than one half who are. And you can do a similar thing if you disaggregate by income level. So if you want to put a point on it, the shocking thing is that if you wanted to predict what a kid knows or what a child knows at the end of eighth grade, you could do it pretty well by knowing the color of their skin or the their zip code or, um, you know, their zip code, that's enough said, I think. And so that's a problem. And you get similar results in reading as you get in math. Another thing that's, I think, troubling is that the differences that we see as kids enter school only increase across the elementary grades. So in the lower one, you have kids who are defined by this particular research as at risk academically. It's not my favorite term. But you can see that the difference in their ability, their sort of ca academic capabilities are widening across school. Here's another look that I find a little more compelling. And I'm partly throughout this talk would ask you to think with me what of the different things I'm showing you today, I mean, we're all educators in one way or another, which of the things I'm talking about today would be especially persuasive if we wanted the public to get this problem better than they do? So if you find examples in my talk that you think would help us when we're trying to do a better public campaign than we do right now, tell me that. Because part of my goal in the role I play right now is to find ways to tell other people in this country that teaching really matters and it isn't so easy and we really do have a problem, so wake up. So if you find things you think would help with that, tell me. So here's another look that I find sometimes convinces people better than all those data. Um, if you just took nine-year-olds growing up in low-income communities, you would be able to say that they're on average three grade levels already below their peers in uh, more affluent communities. They have only a one in two chance of graduating from high school on the whole. And those who do graduate from high school aren't reading or doing math better than at an eighth grade level. That's a different way to portray the data. But <laughs> if you wanted people to get it, then we're not providing a common education by any stretch of the imagination that would help you. And what you have to figure out how to avoid is having a blame the teacher or blame the kids approach to it or blame the parents approach. This is about fundamental differences in opportunity to learn. So it's an opportunity gap problem we're talking about here that isn't very visible to many people. Now, I said I would just make graphic for you, literally, how rapidly the American school age population is also changing, even as you look at data of these types. So here's one that I find kind of interesting. In 1972, the school age population was about 80% white, 15% African American, and a small fraction of students were Latino and of even smaller other ethnic groups. But if you look at um, 33 years later, you can see that the white school age population has shrunk to below 60%. The African American school age population remained about constant over that period, but where you see big changes in the Latino population and in other groups. So, I mean, just dramatically, you can see the changing in the ethnic composition. And the projections by 2030 is that, as you know, we'll see a population that's below 50% white and increasing in the composition of the um, other populations that make up our school age. Um, groups. Now, if you look at language, which is an interesting another way, another way to look at the diversity of American kids, this one is kind of interesting, although the graph is a little hard to interpret. Here, what it's essentially showing is that in 1979, roughly 12% of American kids spoke a language other than English in the home. And now, in uh, 2005, one out of four American school children speak a language other than English in the home. But what's also interesting is that this bar along the bottom represents those children who speak English, a language other than English at home, and who speak English in school with difficulty. In other words, they're struggling in school as a function of speaking more than one language. That hasn't changed very much. That's not a very large group. So that's not that that's not a concern. But we're certainly not using the resources that those kids bring by being multilingual very well. And moreover, this should say to you also that education professionals in schools are increasingly interacting with children's home, uh, home you know, caregivers, family members, and others with whom those children live who may not speak English comfortably. So the language challenges for American teachers are definitely increasing. And that's a pretty dramatic change in a short period. So, you know, the fact is that we really want a lot of our schools and we're not really equipping them to do it. We want to reduce these disparities in opportunities and achievement, but at the same time, we're trying to aim for more complex goals with more kids than we ever had before. 
I find um, rather compelling, especially when I talk to other people, about why I find the achievement gap language not very useful by talking, first of all, about what are different explanations for what we see. Well, what we see is very different, big differences in opportunity to learn, and uh, depending on the measure, pretty big differences in what kids leave school with. I'm drawing here now from Carol Lee's most recent book. Carol Lee, if you haven't had her in, is a very, I think, very unusual scholar at Northwestern University who has been, over the last two decades, continuing her career as a high school English teacher on the south side of Chicago, but with her training in literary interpretation, bringing together serious work on studying what the resources are that um, African-American urban students in her community bring and how to link that up with rigorous work on literary criticism. And I find it just extremely interesting. And in the front of her book, she offers um, three explanations for what it would take to both explain and also therefore address these so-called achievement gaps. And she's not saying that these aren't all viable as explanations, but she makes a very strong argument for the third. So one argument that we hear most frequently is that there are just enormous um, structural inequalities in our society, economic and otherwise, and we have huge problems of intergenerational poverty and inequities in school funding and the like, and these resource issues set up a basically untenable situation for schools. That's one kind of explanation that people give that locates most of the problem in society and doesn't really touch down all that much in schools. See schools to some extent as victims of a much larger set of societal and historical problems. She's not saying that's not true, that is true, but there's more to it than that. The second thing she identifies, which is also hugely dominant and gets closer to the educational explanations given, is to see these students growing up in these communities that are less affluent and higher minority as deficient or deficient somehow. And you see the language of remediation or compensatory education, which has fully filled up our discourse over the last 40 years, um, being one that sees the kids as having the problem and figures out how to fill them up with things they're lacking. And, Carol's not saying that there, isn't, there are not realistically things that kids might need that they may not have encountered. That's not an argument either. But the third one, which her book hugely centers on, is that another way to understand the problem is that there's a giant mismatch between the way schools are set up to work and for whom and what they're able to do then with the variety of kids they enroll. So that there are big cultural mismatches between what kids bring to school and what schools are equipped to do. Schools being teachers and other education professionals, the curriculum. In other words, kids bring resources to school that schools aren't set up to use well. And that's why I find her book so compelling, because rather than just saying this and sounding romantic about it, in graphic detail, she shows you what it has meant to have kids in South Side of Chicago doing criticism of poetry and literature that my undergraduates at Michigan, who come from very affluent communities for the most part, can't touch, and they're college students. And when they watch videos of these high school students doing this work, their mouths drop open. Carol is able to get these kids to do significant work, but the way she's doing it is by knowing how to make use of resources that they bring. So it's seeing the cultural repertoires of practice that kids have and being serious and relentless about the connection of that to um, co conventional academic outcomes, maybe not even conventional, unconventional complex outcomes. So that takes me up to sort of what the main thing I want to talk about, which I promised, is to say, so what does this mean then? If we want to take Carol's argument seriously and wanted to think about what it would mean for schools to be much better equipped to take up the diversity of kids I just showed you so that we didn't have the patterns of data that I was describing, what would that look like? Well, now, we have to be honest about the fact that we've been trying to fix schools in this country pretty much as long as we've had them, and our history of failing to fix them or improve them is just about as long. So it's worth pausing for a moment to ask ourselves what have been typically the key levers for trying to improve schools. And I guess I want to insert a little caution because the key levers are the ones we keep trying to deploy. So why that is, why we don't learn that they by themselves don't do enough, I don't know, but I want to put them out there before we go further. Um, so again, I'm going to use math as my example, but you could replace math with science or literacy or whatever you want. So one logical thing is to say, if we have all these problems, let's get a, this you know, more rigorous curriculum in place. We're not expecting enough of our kids. Let's get something in place that actually develops skills and gets them, you know, if we look at other countries, gets them into a curriculum that's more demanding. There's a footnote on that, which is to say, it's actually not the case that our curriculum is less demanding. There are other things going on that are closer to my argument about the way we deliver our curriculum, but you can ask me more about that if you want. 
A second big policy argument, and just to open the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, on random days, you can find this one, is let's just solve the problem by getting people who are trained better in the subjects into classrooms, and that'll solve our problem. Somehow we have the wrong people there, so let's get people who know these subjects. Let's find some um, smart, you know, smart math types on the street and get them into classrooms. Alternatively, a different version of that doesn't talk so much about subject matter, but just says, Let's you know, stop with the Mickey Mouse stuff already. Let's just make it easier for people who are smart and socially committed to get into classrooms and teach. Um, and the final one, which might be more sensitive in this environment, is let's pay teachers more. If we paid them more, we would get you know, results different than the ones we're seeing. And I just, you know, not to be too cute, want to be a little cautious about all of these. It's not that none of those has any value. They do. Would I like teachers to be paid more? Of course. I mean, it's very clear that that's a problem. Would I say that it would be important to try to recruit more people into teaching? Yes, but I'd put as high a priority on recruiting a better representation of American population in the classroom as much as more mathematically trained people. And I already said briefly that the curriculum by itself isn't the issue. In fact, we often think that the curriculum is sort of the heart of the matter. Let's get a different curriculum and somehow that will change everything. So we can go back to this if you like, because I'd like to kind of plunge forward to say why these don't feel satisfactory to me, even though they each have some merit. So my argument is basically, let's be honest about the fact. Teachers actually matter a lot, and there are very good empirical studies that can help you to make the argument, if you need to, that who the teacher is in a classroom accounts for a very large proportion of the variation in what kids gain across a school year. And again, I don't really right now want to talk about the problems with the measures, because I don't think that's why you're seeing that. You're seeing it because of something that any of us who has taught knows, which is teachers actually can make a very significant difference in kids' opportunities, their confidence, what they actually manage to do as far as their work, and what they learn. So even if we had measures that we liked better, I think we would see this result. But if you're willing to entertain the fact that there are good, hard data using the achievement data we have right now, you can show people whom you might need to show this to that who the teacher is matters. And one significant thing about this is to say a lot of the discussion is about under-resourced schools and under-resourced communities and school conditions, which are, of course, really problematic. But what's important here is that these data show you that within the same school who the teacher is makes a difference. The within school teacher effects are significant. So two teachers teaching in the same under-resourced school can be making rather different differences for kids. So that should give us some hope, because if it were all so big and structural, where would we be able to make any impact? So obviously then, if that's true, and if you buy that part of my argument, if you don't, then we're sort of stuck. But if you buy that part, that at least one significant part of the issue is who the teacher is, then we have, we're narrowing the problem a little in terms of what we could do that would look different than my caution slide, which is we could either do better at recruiting teachers, or we could improve the way we train teachers. And I'm deliberately using the word training today, I'm very happy to have people push me on it. I know that the more word that's been more um, popular for all of us to use is education or development, but I frankly want to argue that if we're serious about the skill level and professionalism that it takes to teach, we shouldn't be so embarrassed about talking about training. Physicians aren't embarrassed about talking about medical training, and we shoot ourselves a little bit in the foot by making it sound like it's all pretty loose to become a teacher. It's not so loose. It's actually pretty difficult to learn to teach well, so I'm provoking you a little with that word. Before we go much further, I want to actually get us on the ground by looking at a little piece of videotape of a teacher teaching, partly to engender a little more sympathy with the complexity and intricacy of the work. This is a very well-intentioned teacher trying to do something difficult, and something goes wrong, which could go wrong for anybody in this room. I want you to just watch it, just to get yourself out of any space of thinking too abstractly about teacher's work, okay? So just to give a little context for those of you who aren't, uh, how many people in here have taught elementary school mathematics at some point? Okay, how many people have taught some other level or subject in the room? Okay, so for those of you who've never taught, then you should feel humbled by this, and for those who taught <laughs> math, you'll be familiar, and those of you, others can probably empathize. So this teacher's just doing warm-ups at the beginning of class, and she's working with her students on problems involving um, negative and positive mixed numbers, and it's just some warm-up problems, and this, we're gonna watch her discussing this problem, um, she's been able to participate in some professional development in which one of the things she's been working on is trying to make problems like this make more sense to her students. So she's um, been using things that help to model the meaning of these operations. Um, so she's been using, in this case, red pies to represent negative numbers and green pies to represent positive numbers. So that's the model then of 
negative four and two thirds. See that with the red pies? And the positive one and five six pies is with green. We're not talking right now, do we like this problem? Is it real world? It's really not my point. Because that's another conversation that we sometimes get distracted by. Right now, I just want you to look at what it takes for her to work with her kids and what it is that goes wrong and why it goes wrong. So before we watch the video, you should do two things. I'm going to give you a minute to talk to people at your table. One is do the arithmetic so you know the answer. <laughs> no, no, really. Just like remind yourself what the answer to it is. And then just take a minute with someone around you and say, ask yourself, do you get how you would use this model to get that answer? Like, do you see what you would do with it? Just see if you can do that. Just take a minute and then you'll watch the video. What do I do? Put this mic. Put this mic. Put this mic. Put this Oh. But there's no sound cable, right? We're just using it. Where is the mic on here, do you think? Minus two and five six, is that what everyone got? OK, very good. No, that's not what you got? <laughs> OK, since they didn't bring me here to, to work on elementary arithmetic, I guess I won't go over that. But And you have a little idea of what you think might need to be done with this, these pies. Um, so now I'm going to show you the video where the teacher is going over that problem with her class. And I want you to watch, see what you notice. Remember that the goal right now isn't do you like this teacher, do you like this problem. We're trying to watch the work of teaching to see what makes it intricate, building up to the argument that really not anyone can just walk in and do this. And if we were serious about improving learning opportunities, we have to work at this level of what it takes to do the work. So I want you to watch sympathetically and carefully about what it is that goes on. Okay. We're hoping that the sound is going to work. We have a slightly improvised method for the sound. Oh, there's going to be um, text track along the bottom to support those of you who aren't used to listening to um, fourth graders talk. It will interpret for you, because it is a little bit, <laughs> little bit of a foreign language sometimes when kids and teachers talk. But that will help if the sound isn't so good, too. Okay, so let's get back in, get back together again. Hopefully part of what you're noticing is that just the sheer, um, the sheer complexity of getting that model onto the board correctly and actually thinking through carefully in advance about what you have to do to sh make it work is non-trivial and teaching requires so much stuff all the time. Um, so just in case you haven't seen this done before, essentially what she needed to be doing was something like this where she would match up you know, one negative pi, so to speak, and one positive, then she could match up the, the, in this following way like that. So you'd match those two thirds, you'd still have a six. So then that pi would also have to be split into six. Then you could cancel out one more six, and then you would see your two that's one way you could do it. But one thing that has gone wrong is that she's made the picture on the fly, which all of us who've taught have done. And she probably hasn't like fully thought it through before she's doing it. So then she gets into this, oops. Um, it's actually interesting as a footnote that it, there are uh, cultures in which it's more typical to prepare charts like this in advance. And certainly American teachers do that too. But you can see why maybe making that drawing and putting it up beforehand would avoid at least some of that problem. But still the rehearsal of exactly how does the explanation work is non-trivial. And this is, by the way, uh, just if we're going to collect examples, if I were to ask you know, the average well-educated faculty member at the University of Michigan, not in the ed school, but just you know, random faculty member, to be able to use a diagram to show the meaning of negative 4 and 2 thirds plus 1 and 5 six, they would no way be able to do that. They probably, probably most of them could get the answer, although in some fields they couldn't because they wouldn't have done you know, anything with fractions in decades. So just sort of on the, uh, in the spirit and on the campaign to convince people that teaching requires enormous amounts of skill, even if it is just fourth grade math or whatever, is actually really important to our endeavor, in my opinion. So anyway, that's probably what part of what was going on. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a case that will provoke a little further into this question of what does it take to teach? Because here what it took was trying to make the thing make sense, being prepared to give the explanation or to have a student do it or whatever. So I want to first now pause on the very important but not sufficient question of what is it we're learning about what it means to know your content well enough to teach it. I want to do this and then we're going to move on to, but that isn't all the story anyway. But let's stop on this because 
if anything should be solvable, it ought to be that we could prepare people to at least know the academic subjects that they have to teach. And we're uniquely responsible for that. There are many other professionals who work with youth, social workers, community workers, and the like. We're the only profession responsible for academic learning. So with all the other things we want teachers to be skillful at in our current diverse society and all of its issues, we better worry about this because we won't be able to do what we're here to do if we can't. And it hasn't been as easy to address as one might have thought. Because on one hand, the good news, and not surprising, I suppose, is that it's quite clear from empirical research that teachers' knowledge of the content really does matter for kids' learning. It's too bad we needed research to show that. But it hasn't been all that easy to show. And one reason is, and this, I think, needs to get really amplified in the policy discourse, that at least in mathematics, it's not about how many courses the teacher has taken. So I don't know what this does to the highly qualified definition, but that there's not good evidence that at the K-8 level, in fact, there's not evidence, so let's put it more clearly, that how many t courses a teacher has taken in mathematics can predict how well her students will do in math. There just isn't, not at the K-8 level. And there are only modest signals of that at the high school level where you'd expect the signal to be pretty strong. So that's not enough to satisfy the question of how we would make sure teachers knew enough. It can't be just by adding up course credits. And I'm not even going to touch the, and they have to be certified, because that's just an elaboration of the same question, because certification is also a measure of what they've taken. But we do have evidence that knowing the content in a way that I'm going to call today specialized for the work of teaching does actually have an effect on whether kids can learn. So I want to give you a brief little tour of what I mean by that. And this might count as one of the examples we could show non-professionals if we wanted to persuade them that it's more than knowing how to do fourth grade math to enable you to teach fourth grade. So this is the two step that I like to do. The first stage is you should do this, uh, you should do this multiplication problem just like I had you do the fraction. So what's the answer to this? What? 1225? Okay. So we would want to expect, I'm not sure we can, that most people who have graduated from high school in this country, or maybe less, ought to be able to get that answer. And teachers also have to know that. You can't teach people to multiply if you can't multiply yourself. So let's put that just down and tell policymakers, yes, you know, we get it. Teachers have to know the content they're teaching. It's just that's so much not the whole story. So one way to think about this is that when you're teaching multiplication, as I think I said in the research brief, kids don't always get the answer that they're supposed to get. So then where are you? If you, they get the wrong answer and all you're capable of saying is, oops, you got it wrong, it doesn't make you much of a teacher. That would be a little bit like going you know, in for an examination in your physician's office with a, some kind of complaint and the physician would say to you, oh, you seem to be sick. You wouldn't find that very useful. And I don't think making an error in math is like being sick, but the diagnostic capability that we've underestimated in teaching is critical to being effective. You have to be able to figure out what's going on so that you can choose what to do. And it's not all that helpful, frankly. I might alienate some of my um, research colleagues with this, but I don't think it's that helpful to think that every time a student makes a mistake, you should interview them. I mean, you know, in a regular classroom <laughs> where you have a lot of kids, it might be helpful if you could rather quickly say, I bet this is what went on. And then you could try to ask some questions or you could do something to help correct what was going on. So I want to give you a little taste of that, thinking about the difference between knowing how to multiply and knowing it well enough to do this diagnostic work. So here are three errors that could very likely come up in a fourth grade class. I'd like you to take a moment and use what you know about multiplication. You don't have to know anything about kids to do this. And see how quickly you can figure out diagnostically what produced these three answers. How many people in the room right now know, could answer that for all three problems? Raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty interesting actually because um, this is actually a pretty professional group in the room and it illustrates my point that this is not so easy. Um, well, I think that's important and I think one thing to point out is that if you were teaching this subject, 
you really would want to be able to size this up pretty quickly. It's interesting how we always are at pains to tell kids being good at math isn't being quick, which is true. But being good in math as a teacher is actually to have to be quick sometimes. You can't wait 12 minutes figuring out what a kid is saying. You actually would have to know rather more quickly. So there's kind of fluency you need to be a teacher that we don't talk about very much. So would somebody like to explain one of these? Or at least hypothesize about it? What do you think? Which one? In B, they got the first part right. They did the multiplication of the right to the top. But then what happens was the bottom, they reversed uh, the mathematics. So they did 4 times 25, and that's how they got the 100. So they get 4 times 25 got them the 100. And what did they do to get the 225? They actually went upside down, right? 25 times 9? Uh -huh. So they, 25 times 9 is 225, and then 25 times 4, which is actually 40, didn't come out there. Exactly. So see that's so sort of upside down of probably the method you tend to use, plus then multiplying uh, times 4 instead of 40. What about A or C? I think A, A. Can you speak up a little bit? Okay, so one possibility is 9 times 5 is 45, and then just write down 45, which kids might do. And then 9 times 2 is 18, and write 10. That's a little less likely, but more likely, in fact, does anyone have another one? More likely is 9 times 5 is 45, carry the 4, and then add the 4 to the 4 right away, which would give you 8. And 8 times 5 is 40. And similarly, 9 times 2 is 18, carry the 1, add the 1 to the 4, and then 5 times 2 is 10. And that's, you know, very likely because when you add numbers, you don't have to wait to add the carry and you can do it whenever you want. So that's just an order. And frankly, if you were teaching this grade, you would also want to be able to explain why it matters. You wouldn't want to just remember, don't add the carry in because they'll just forget it over the weekend anyway. So it sort of helps if you can explain why. And the third one is essentially, uh, does somebody want to say it? Yeah, so 20, 49 times 50, nice estimation, and then went up instead of down. And that would make sense, because 49 is lower, so maybe you think you have to compensate up. But this kind of thinking, which, you know, if you've taught this grade level, it could help you, because you might have seen these before. But essentially, I'm arguing this is a kind of knowing math that permits you to see the math from someone else's point of view rather than your own, and think about it in a problem-solving way. And that's at the heart of being diagnostic, at least in math. So this is a kind of specialized knowing of math. The way we've been thinking about that, I'll just say briefly, just to give you a sense, is in order to build what I would call a more practice-based theory of the content knowledge it needs to teach, we start by studying teaching instead of start by studying the curriculum and try to figure out what is it that goes on in the course of teaching that demands mathematical skill. What comes up, like kids make mistakes or you have to choose an example. Choosing an example to put on the board is mathematically very demanding work. And when you pick a bad example, you know it. And in fact, it involves a kind of thinking mathematically that the average person on the street doesn't have to, to, doesn't have to do. Like, was 49 times 25 a good example for my example to you? We could analyze that. And that kind of thinking is important. From that, we tried to figure out, well, what kind of math do you need to know to do those sorts of tasks that come up in teaching? And then we tried to think, well, how would you help people learn this? Because if it were obvious, then all the teachers who are out there would already know this. So it must not be automatic that you just learn it from experience or from professional training. And then we also, and I'll say something brief about this, try to start developing in a sort of radical way new kinds of test items that could test if teachers know this math in this way. Because we wanted to try to see, like, were we right? Would it be true that teachers who knew this kind of what I'm describing to you actually were better in the classroom than people who didn't, because that seemed to be demanded by what we were trying to figure out. And I'll just share a little bit about that. Um, we did a couple of kinds of things. One thing we did was we videotaped lots of teachers and then um, compared the mathematical quality of their teaching, which I can explain, to how they scored on these items without knowing how they scored. In other words, first we looked at their teaching, then later compared to how they'd scored. And we found that there was a pretty substantial correlation, like on the order of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, depending on 
where you look in the analysis, between how they scored and the quality of their teaching. And by quality, I don't mean how good a teacher they were. I meant literally the mathematical quality. Do they make mistakes? Do they run into the kind of thing that teacher I just showed you run into? Were they able to hear what kids were saying and ask a question in response? Just the mathematical part of their work. And we found that the test items were you know, in the right ballpark of selecting those teachers who knew the math that way. So I'll give an example of a test item just so you can imagine what would a test item look like compared to the kind of licensure exams we give right now that are basically just typical math tests. So here's an example. Um, MKT just stands for Mathematical Knowledge for Teaching. So this problem says, here are three students. It's a little like what I just showed you, except in this case, it's not an error. Three students all get the correct answer, because the answer to 35 times 25 is 875. But which of the students is using a way of doing the multiplication that actually would work no matter what two whole numbers you use? And the reason that matters is if a kid does an unusual procedure in class, a teacher actually has to know, like, is this fruitful? Is this just a fluke? Should I ask the rest of the kids whether they think this will work? Or should I tell the kid, like, don't do that again? Whatever it is you're going to do, you'd first have to know if it's mathematically viable. So that's what the question's asking. Does anyone have a thought about that? You see what it's getting at? So the one that you're most familiar with is student B, probably, right? Is that, the most, is that what most people learn to do, where you multiply kind of like you were saying earlier, 35 times 5, and then, OK. So student A is doing kind of what we saw in the mistake example. She, this person's multiplying upside down, right? 25 times 5 and 25 times 30. And that's correct, because multiplication is commutative. So of course, you can multiply in either order. That's something a teacher would have to recognize kind of quickly. And this one over here, many people you might recognize, this is simply what's called full partial product, where you do 35 times, you do 5 times 5, and then 30 times 5, and then 5 times 20, and then 30 times 20, and you add them all up. It's kind of the, before you get to learning how to carry, you can just do it in all the parts. Um, just to provoke you a little bit, when we were trying to validate whether these actually got at the kind of specialized knowledge we were interested in, we gave a lot of these items to mathematicians as well as to teachers. This item was very hard for mathematicians, which I thought was very telling and helpful to the argument. People would look at these and say things to me in the interviews like, one person said, pointing at C, where did that person get all those numbers? Where's the 25 and the, which, if you know some math, it should be surprise you because essentially this is just like multiplying the quantity A plus B times the quantity C plus D. That's what you get are four terms. But the mathematician simply couldn't see it in this form. And I think that my hypothesis about this is partly that the kind of flexibility you need to have around the content to teach is actually different than what you need to be successful as a research mathematician. They don't need that kind of, oh, here's another way to do it that might be unusual, or here's another way to represent it. It's not part of their work. But my argument is the work of teaching demands that kind of ability to see something, from, again, from someone else's perspective and be able to think about it rather quickly. So items like this are what we developed. And we built up over a few years a whole battery of items in different topical areas of elementary school mathematics and middle school. And I'll show one result that bears directly back to the achievement opportunity gap issues that we were talking about earlier. So one question we had besides comparing how they did in their classroom, like what their teaching looked like, and their scores. An even more fundamental question would be, do teachers who score better on this kind of measure, do their students learn more? Again, with the apologies for the achievement measure problems, I think this is still an important finding. Because what we found was, it did, it did correlate. So let me just explain briefly what we did. We built a questionnaire that used 30 of these types of items, like I just showed you. The scale reliability was actually quite good for those of you who know something about test design, because you usually have to get more items than 30 to get that kind of reliability. So that's pretty good. And then we modeled it by comparing the teacher's scores to achievement gains on Terra Nova, which is a very widely used, or was at that time, very widely used achievement test. And when we tried to examine, well, what's the effect of the teacher's knowledge on kids' achievement gains, we also had to say, well, what else would predict differences in kids' achievement gains across a school year? And you could name them as well as I. If the kid comes to school regularly, if the teacher comes to school regularly, what book is used? what the family background characteristics are, and all of those things, what the teacher studied, the typical teacher quality types of measures. And interestingly, what we found was that the teacher knowledge score did significantly predict differences in kids' achievement gains across a school year. The effect size is not very large. It's roughly one-tenth of a standard deviation. What that means is that two teachers, each scoring one standard deviation apart on the knowledge measure, the higher scoring teacher 
had students who gained that much more across the school year. But if you translate that effect into a meaningful term, it turned out to be about as though the higher scoring teacher's students had received two to three weeks more instruction in a school year. It's not trivial. So it's both statistically significant and somewhat meaningful as well. But I find the second thing even more interesting, which was the student socioeconomic status variable, that is the family background characteristics and where the student lives and family income and such, was about the same effect size as the teacher knowledge score. So that's actually a very hopeful result because that gets back to my argument that if you really want to make a difference for what kids in our country are having opportunities to learn, worry more about what teachers are able to do because this suggests that that competes with what right now I said earlier is one of the shockingly most dominant ways to predict kids' achievement is what the color of their skin is or their zip code. This suggests that a teacher who knows math in this way actually able to, you know, that effect is as large as the thing I just told you was really a big effect. So now what I want to do is show a second video. And the reason this is because this time I'm going to show you a teacher who has control over the math. And actually, she's doing something very difficult. But this is to open the conversation more broadly. Like, that is not enough. Even if we could get teachers who knew the math in this way that I'm describing, which is not easy, there's still a lot of other stuff to worry about. So in this video, the teacher's doing something very difficult, which is she's teaching long division. And she's using manipulatives to show what it means. This is really hard to do. I actually myself only figured out how to do this a few years ago. It's not easy, much harder than other operations, because there's a lot going on in long division. And I'll just tell you right now, she's got very good control over it. So even if it's not familiar to you, notice that she's doing it with a lot of skill. But there are other issues I want you to pay attention to. One issue that you'll need to know before I can show you the video is that she just called this group over to the corner by saying, I want to see my kids who are still having trouble with division. And you come over here, and the rest of you do this worksheet. She says it a little bit nicer than that, but it's basically the message. So I just want that the context. Now watch closely what's going on. And the question I'm going to ask you is, what else is there to appreciate about what it takes to be very skillful at teaching? And what are the issues you're noticing? Um, and just suggest to you that there are other things going on here about who's getting to talk, how people are, how kids are being treated, uh, and there, are, if you've taught, you can imagine some of the things that are going into that, but it's complicated, and she may not, there's just a lot to keep track of. The four girls who are all African American haven't said a word, and don't say a word if I can go any further. She's got this one boy, white boy, doing all of the talking. She, there are just things going on about the dynamic that could have very important consequences for how students are understanding what, they're, what the opportunity for learning, how people are regarding themselves, that we could spend more time on. And the reason I want to show that is because although the content knowledge stuff is important, it's in interaction with a bunch of other things. So I want to sort of pull this together a bit to say something about the strategy. So you have to understand instruction as interaction, as I think Ron said earlier. So instruction isn't what teachers do all by themselves. It's the interplay of what they do as they work with multiple kids around content. And that takes a huge amount of coordination that I think many people don't appreciate. You're coordinating among kids over time, complicated objectives, and you have to get to certain goals, and this all occurs over time. That's a very complicated act. And kids are influencing each other as well. So it's not like it's one teacher with one kid or one teacher with a sort of amorphous glob of kids. What kids say during instruction influences each other, so you're coordinating that too. You have a problem of resources and how you deploy them to help kids learn. And that's all happening in environments that are filled with all kinds of mixed signals about what counts and what matters and what your principal wants and what the test demands and what parents are worried about or what the community is. And all of that is part of what teachers are coordinating. So my argument, in effect, is that if we want to make a difference, and think of those two classrooms I showed you, it's really a significantly a problem of improving dramatically how we train or educate teachers. And there are two reasons why I'd argue that. One is surely the scale problem. So if we had a tiny profession, maybe we could make the argument differently. Maybe we could recruit people. Maybe we could find people who just can naturally be good at this. We can't actually afford that, because even if there are people who are natural at this, they aren't at the scale we need. Look at this. I mean, this is a, a graph of the teaching profession. You probably know this. But teachers are the left-hand bar here. 
3.7 million teachers, basically, and that number is in 2003, so the number may be slightly different. But what's also important is the ordering of occupations in our society. That is the largest occupation, the largest occupation. So we have an enormous mass profession, and we want them to do pretty intricate work. So that prevents a conundrum, because on one hand, we really need the public to get it, that you cannot walk off the street and do this. But if we make it sound so complicated and we give people no training or resources to really do intricate work like I just showed you, we have a mess on our hands because it is so many people, there's so many people who have to learn to do this and they have to be regular people. We can't build the profession on heroines and heroes or people who are somehow natural teachers because if there are any natural teachers, they're a minority. And if we had more time, I'd give you my little argument about how teaching is not only not something somebody is mostly born to do, but actually requires you to do a lot of very unnatural things that are hard to learn not to do. Things you do in everyday life that you just can't do as a teacher. A short, small sample of that is um, you have to assume most of the time that you need to probe what kids mean. But if I probed every time you said something to me, we would have a dysfunctional conversation. You've got to ask questions you already know the answer to. That's not very natural. And you're not at liberty to decide you like some of your kids and don't like others. Like you might decide in everyday life you like some people better than others. It's not your professional job to like kids. Your professional job is to care about their learning. These are all things that are not natural, and you have to basically learn how to not do some things that are natural and functional in the rest of your life if you're going to be a skilled teacher. So between the scale problem, the intricacy of the work which I tried to show you, and the fact that it's really fundamentally quite unnatural, not a good idea to be yourself in the classroom, frankly. And I know we say that a lot, but think of all the ways that being yourself would be evil to be in the classroom, which is either inappropriate or evil. You have to cultivate a certain professional way of being. It's a professional role. So then the problem is really improving teacher education. But I'm sorry to tell you, and I can say this maybe honestly, since I'm the dean of a school of education, we don't have a reliable system of initial or continuing education in this country. And the problems are pretty simple to name and just hard to tackle. One is we don't prepare people to know their subject matter the way I described earlier. We hugely do not prepare people for the diversity of American classrooms. And this goes for whether the teachers themselves come out of minority communities. They, too, also need help learning. And white teachers need it. Whoever you are, the point is that you're working across big cultural linguistic boundaries. And learning how to use your own cultural resources and overcome them is a big task. And there are other things that we don't have to go into right now. So this takes me back to the question is, why don't we have a better system? And maybe there are some possible reasons. One is, teaching remains invisible for most people. It seems to be something that's just in the water. I think there's some reasons for this. One is, we don't have good language for talking about teaching in English. You know, it's interesting, in Japan, there's a much more highly developed vocabulary for all kinds of distinctions that teachers would like to be able to make in English, but it's really hard to do because English has such a clumsy vocabulary. Even the word teaching is not a very good word because you sort of want a word that's teaching and learning like together. That's why I use the word instruction, but I have to always explain that that's what I mean. I mean teaching and learning like in that diagram. Um, some of the work that goes on is inside teachers' heads. It's pretty hard for beginners to learn it when experienced teachers don't always, can't always make so visible what they're doing. We don't have very good frameworks for looking at the work. We tend to talk about whether we like something or we would want to do that ourselves, but actually describing teaching isn't so easy. There are other things I don't want to spend so much time. So why have we had so much trouble building a good system of teacher education? Well, one possibility is it's just not very strong. We're kind of aiming at the wrong parts of it. We're not preparing people enough for what they're really going to have to do. So they come with their experience from schools, all hung out in schools all their life. And then we intervene on things that are about their beliefs or images of teaching when actually they need to learn how to do teaching. And it may not be a very strong intervention. Um, we don't have a very strong knowledge base about the work of teaching and what's crucial to do and how much difference that would make for kids learning. But the culture of teacher education is also vulnerable because on one hand, we're really conservative. A lot of the coursework in most ed schools looks the same as it looked in 1960. Methods courses, ed psych, and field work, and so on. I'm not saying it hasn't changed at all, but it hasn't changed much. But on the other hand, it's also curiously very faddish. Big swings in what's sort of popular to do. So I don't know how you put those two things together. But adding it all up is that we don't do the following thing, which is to make teaching practice the actual content of professional education. And that's what I'm claiming we'd have to do. So this is what that diagram would look like. You'd have a new instructional triangle, like the kind I showed you, where that's the original one that I described. But it would be the content corner now. So in the original one, this would be math or science or something like that. And that's what kids are learning. But 
teacher developers or school leaders or whoever was helping teachers to learn, sometimes teacher leaders, would be working with teachers to learn that. And that's not really the way we've organized it. So my argument essentially is, going back to the beginning, I'll end with this quote from the New York Times, which is the kind of thing I spend a lot of my time railing against, which is, you know, suppose Colin Powell tires of giving big speeches or Meryl Streep wants to stop acting. Let's just relax the barriers so people can get into teaching more easily, either right out of college or later as a mid-career switch. There are lots of other problems, but this one would be easy to solve. And this argues, this is Nick, Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times uh, about a year ago. If they've graduated from a recognized college, have passed a competency test in their field, and have passed a rigorous background check. So I'll end with this. Can you imagine doing this in any other, anything else in our society? Can you imagine, let's say, plumbing? Putting untrained people to work in settings where skillful performance is most needed, or hairdressing, or engineering, or building bridges, or flying planes? Or would we allow in any other occupation for standards of good practice to vary by income, race, or geography? And would we believe for any other line of work that it depends primarily on common sense and being smart? I submit we would never do that. And I think we need a campaign externally to convince the public that that won't fly. But we have a lot of work to do internally about living up to what it would mean to actually prepare people for what I'm claiming is both intricate and unnatural work. And if we don't, I promise that somebody like me will be giving the same talk in this room 10 years from now because we keep circling around the problem of teaching quality. It's not a problem of teacher quality. Our goal is about getting better instruction not getting better teachers. The teachers are fine. They haven't been helped in many cases to do really difficult work. So I'll stop with that. <laughs>